Kalbari. And a curfew imposed near Minneapolis after police fatally shoot a black man at a traffic stop. You're watching The World. A Samoa stunning election result, could there soon be a change of government in the small Pacific nation? Well, Iran has vowed to take revenge against Israel, blaming its adversary for an attack on its underground Natanz nuclear site. The attack took place just after new advanced centrifuges to enrich uranium had been activated over the weekend, with the facility losing power. Tehran described it as an act of nuclear terrorism. And while Israel has not formally commented, public radio there cited intelligence sources saying it was a Mossad cyber operation. U.S. intelligence officials told the New York Times that a large explosion had completely destroyed the independent internal power system that supplies the centrifuges inside the underground facility. Iran says it will not deter its nuclear program. All of the centrifuges that have gone out of service due to this incident were IR1 type. Everyone has to know that they will be replaced with advanced types. The Islamic Republic is capable right now to replace them with the most advanced centrifuges. And we'll have more on the story a little later in the program. Myanmar's deposed leader Aung San Suu Kyi has been hit with a new criminal charge as she appeared in court via video link. The Nobel Peace Prize laureate has already been charged with various offences, including violating a colonial-era secrets act that could put her in jail for 14 years. Her lawyer says an additional claim was filed against her on Monday related to coronavirus protocols. Aung San Suu Kyi was charged further with one more offence. That is the same law and the same, under the same law and under the same uh, section. Uh, Natural Disasters Management Law, Section 25. But this is the new case. Ms Suchi also asked to be allowed to meet with her lawyers in person, having only spoken with them in the presence of security guards over video since being detained back in February. Well, the U.S. state of Minnesota is again dealing with civil unrest after another black man was shot by police and later died. Dante Wright, who was facing an arrest warrant, crashed his vehicle after being shot while trying to flee a traffic stop. Hundreds of protesters gathered at the site of the crash before moving to local police headquarters. Dante Wright! Vehicles were destroyed and some businesses broken into before a curfew was introduced. The clashes with police are happening just minutes away from the site of George Floyd's death last year, which sparked weeks of demonstrations across the United States. Well, the head of China's Center of Disease Control has backtracked on claims the country's vaccines have low efficacy in fighting COVID-19. Gao Fu said the Chinese Sinovac jab doesn't have very high protection rates during a press conference over the weekend, but today state media reported that the statement was misinterpreted, claiming Mr Fu was suggesting that increasing the interval between doses may improve effectiveness. China has donated millions of domestically produced vaccines to dozens of countries as part of a global health response effort. A recent study in Brazil found the Sinovac immunisation to be just 50% effective. Solomon Islands has become the first country in the Pacific to receive COVID-19 vaccines from China, but the Sinopharm vaccine, which is already being rolled out in around 80 countries, won't be used just yet, as authorities push on with a rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine instead. Reporter Evan Wasuka has more from the Solomon Islands capital, Honiara. So 50,000 doses of the Sinopharm vaccine arrived here on a chartered flight from China last night. But those doses will go straight into storage for the time being until the World Health Organization gives its approval for those vaccines to be used. Now, health officials here insist that must happen first before that vaccine is rolled out. Now, so far, Solomon Islands doesn't have any community transmission of the coronavirus. It's had 19 cases, but all have been from uh, returning travelers who've come back home here to the Solomons. Now, it's already received 24,000 doses of the 
uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, even though there's been problems about the vaccine uh, with restrictions in Australia over the use. Over here in the Solomon Islands, authorities uh, will go ahead and roll out that vaccine. 7,000 have been allocated for here in the capital in, in Honiara. Um, but health officials now say that with the Sinopharm vaccine, once that's approved, it gives an additional uh, uh, option for officials to use it once it's rolled out. And I spoke to the uh, COVID-19 advisor for the Solomon Islands government, Dr. Yogesh Chowdhury, and this is what he had to say. We must not forget that Sinopharm has already been approved by so many countries of the world, uh, and they are using it. So uh, if our situation becomes desperate, uh, we, might, we might request our technical working group and the Drugs and Therapeutic Committee to come and make recommendations on the use of Sinopharm. The Queen has told members of the royal family that the death of her husband, Prince Philip, has left a huge void in her life. Senior royals, including son Prince Andrew, attended a small church service in Windsor Castle, paying tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh. They spoke of Prince Philip's final hours, describing his death as peaceful. Europe correspondent Samantha Hawley reports. On a crisp spring morning came time for reflection. At church services across the country, Prince Philip was remembered. We meet in tribute to His Royal Highness. In Windsor, Prince Andrew broke his silence. We've lost almost the grandfather of the nation. Um, and I feel very sorry um, and supportive of my mother, who's um, feeling it, I think, probably more than everybody else. She described it as, as, as having left a huge void. Uh, in her life. After the same service, Prince Edward's wife, Sophie, spoke of the Duke's last moments. But it's, you know, it was right for him. It was so gentle. A personal account also came from Prince Philip's only daughter, Anne. In a statement, she said, it is his example of a life well lived and a service freely given that I most wanted to emulate. And those who served for him felt the same way. Not so long ago, these household cavalry veterans helped guard the royal residences. As soon as they put on that ceremonial kit, whether it will be the cavalry breastplate or the bearskin, you actually grow six inches in height. You really do. It is, it is pride. There's a lot of pride in there. We were there and we served in a time when he was a younger man, trooping the colour. We were there when the Queen used to ride side saddle. In the hours ahead, Windsor will begin to spring back to life as national lockdown restrictions begin to ease. But here, more than anywhere, the mood will be muted as locals remember a prince who was a constant presence here. Reverend Sally Lodge knows the community will need time to adjust. A lady said to me just now, actually, she said, um, I'm 71 um, and I've never known a time without Prince Philip. The national period of mourning will end on Saturday after the Duke's funeral. Samantha Hawley, ABC News, Windsor. Well, for the second day in a row, Thailand has reported a record number of new COVID-19 infections. Authorities are considering tightening restrictions as Thais prepare to celebrate their traditional New Year's holiday. Here's Andrea Nierhoff. Making room for the ill. Bangkok officials setting up extra beds as the coronavirus emergency threatens to boil over. Some hospitals in the capital so overloaded they've stopped testing for the virus to concentrate on treating patients. Others have simply used up all their testing supplies. We aim to increase the field hospital beds to 10,000. We want to give the public some confidence that we can still contain this outbreak. Neighbourhood testing centres drawing crowds, many waiting hours for their turn to be swabbed. Longer term, experts are calling on Thailand to speed up its vaccination rollout, accusing it of dragging its heels. Taking the brunt of the blame, the country's usually bustling entertainment sector, with many recent cases traced to nightlife venues. While operators are understanding, they're also running out of patience. I understand that the government is implementing these measures for the protection of the Thai public, but if they choose to keep widely applying these measures to all of us, I can tell you that we will all suffer and eventually die for sure.
Despite fears, the government declined to issue blanket travel restrictions for the Songkran New Year holiday, when millions of Thais normally return home. Though some provinces have still tried to limit travel from high-risk areas such as Bangkok. And close attention will be paid to whether case numbers rise when the party is over. Andrea Nierhoff, ABC News. Let's head back to the UK where Britons are preparing to farewell the Duke but lockdown restrictions are also continuing to ease. For the first time in months, pubs, gardens, non-essential shops, hairdressers and restaurants can now reopen but only under certain conditions. Our Europe correspondent Nick Dole joins us out of London. Nick, good to talk to you. Um, the COVID restrictions are starting to be lifted which is cause for celebration but has that been tempered by the death of Prince Philip in this period of mourning? Yes, I think it has somewhat, Bev. Uh, good evening to you. There, I think, was a real sense of anticipation and excitement in, in the last week or so leading up to today because pubs, restaurants, non-essential shops, uh, hairdressers, all of those sorts of things, outdoor activities like zoos, they can reopen as long as uh, they can be done uh, in a safe way. And generally speaking, all hospitality still needs to be outside despite the cold weather. So. There are people uh, embracing that today. There are people out uh, in the streets and enjoying the pubs. But I think there is a, a slightly more sombre mood than there otherwise would have been because the nation is still technically in this official period of mourning that lasts until Saturday. And we're going to see more of that today because in the coming hours politicians will be making statements uh, to the House of Commons. Parliament has been recalled specifically to give uh, MPs a chance to pay tribute to the Duke and uh, messages from all around the world continue to come through and the Duke's children including Prince Charles have said how touched they are by all the nice things people have been saying and all the anecdotes that have been coming uh, around the world. Prince Harry, his grandson, of course, uh, great-grandson, has arrived home. Grandson, not great-grandson, sorry, has arrived home. Now, it, it is hoped that the family coming together for the Duke's funeral may in some way ease tensions between Prince Harry and the rest of the royal family. That's the hope. Uh, it won't be easy because Harry, as you say, is reportedly back and it, it, we would expect he would have returned by about now because he has to enter a period of quarantine. So under the rules here in the UK, he needs to self-isolate for at least five days and take a test on day five and test negative if he is going to be able to attend his grandfather's funeral. So that will limit the face-to-face the -face contact he has with his family members. But you're right, this is an opportunity. It's the first time that Prince Harry has come face to face with much of his family since that explosive interview that he and Meghan gave with Oprah Winfrey, during which Meghan alleged that a, a member of the royal family had expressed concern about the colour of Archie's skin. And uh, Harry himself had said that he believed his father and his brother William are trapped in the royal family and that he feels sorry for them. So he's returning not as a senior royal, he gave that up, but he's coming back as a, as a son and a grandson uh, and, and this is an opportunity because you know this isn't just a, a family tabloid this really does go to the relevance of the royal family in a modern society so uh, as difficult as it will be for the family I think there are some hoping that uh, this is an opportunity to, to heal that rift for, for the good of, of the royal family itself. Mm. Now, Nick, in terms of the lockdown and the easing that you were talking of earlier, uh, just how much is the UK getting on top of the, this pandemic and how, what impact are the vaccines having at this point? So the government here has always warned people that even though they were setting out a timeline at which things would open up, uh, that if things went bad in terms of case numbers, those plans would be scrapped. But at the moment, things are going extremely well. Uh, just in the last day or so, uh, just yesterday, 1,700 new cases were reported and there were just seven deaths. So putting that in perspective, around Christmas time, there were close to 60,000 daily cases. So things have really come down. Uh, what effect is the vaccine having? It's hard to say because 
uh, until today, there has been an extremely strict lockdown. So that does a very good job of, of putting downward pressure on case numbers. But uh, we have seen an extraordinary uptake of the vaccine here. More than 32 million people have had a first dose uh, and 7 million have already had two doses. And just yesterday, there was a new record of, of close to 500,000 second doses given. So there is certainly a, a degree of immunity in the community and, and experts say, that certainly the lockdown is playing a part, but the vaccine is a big part of that too. Nick Dole in London, thanks so much. Thanks, Beth. Well, a small tourist town has borne the brunt of a cyclone which swept across the Western Australian coast about 700 kilometres north of Perth. Cyclone Saroja hit the town of Kalbarri with unexpected fury, tearing into homes not built to withstand cyclonic winds. <laughs> This is the main street of Calvary. Tropical cyclone Saroja crossed the coast as a Category 3. It hit hard and fast. This is just the people's roofs up and down the street. Early estimates are that 70% of Calvary, a popular tourist town, has been damaged. Uh-oh. As winds of 170 kilometres an hour swept through the community. Homes and businesses not built to withstand cyclonic winds were torn apart. I've been in a couple of cyclones before, but nothing like that. Hearing, I think, the asbestos roofs travel through the air and hit glass was probably the, the worst. Even after the system passed, residents remained under red alert inside their homes, concerned about fallen electricity poles and the debris littering the streets. With electricity gone, many had to wait until daylight to see how badly their homes were damaged. So many people now homeless, eh? You know, like myself and a few other people, they were all homeless. There's no roofs left, there's nothing. We've got no power, I have to stay here. Some weathered the storm aboard their boat. We had to be on board so that we could lengthen the ropes, otherwise you'd uh, virtually tear the rails off. Saroja moved rapidly inland at yep. 50 to 60 kilometres an hour, dumping massive amounts of rain along its path. Kalbarri had record rains, more than 160 millimetres in 24 hours. There's been a range of iconic uh, landmarks that have been uh, been destroyed in this in this event, uh, namely the the, the Carnarvon uh, One Mile Jetty. There goes the fence. There have been some reports of minor injuries, but no major injuries and no deaths, uh, and that's obviously good news for those communities. But authorities are still assessing damage in homes and farms. Contact in the region is difficult, with phone lines and mobile services not working and power to 30,000 homes and businesses disrupted. Evelyn Manfield, ABC News. The detectives investigating the historical rape allegation against former Attorney General Christian Porter were denied permission to travel to South Australia to interview the complainant. The revelation is included in new documents provided by New South Wales Police to the state's parliament. The Deputy Commissioner David Hudson refused the investigators' request to travel during last year's COVID restrictions. Now that's despite the trip being signed off by the head of the Child Abuse and Sex Crime Squad. ABC's Four Corners has revealed Mr Hudson and cited insufficient detail to justify why this travel cannot be deferred. Christian Porter has denied the allegation and is suing the ABC for defamation. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says employees of COVID-19 quarantine workers have until the end of the month to redeploy those who have refused a vaccine. The move comes after a third worker at an isolation facility in Auckland tested positive for COVID-19. Health authorities revealed earlier today the worker had not been vaccinated. Ms Ardern says the safety of New Zealand's managed isolation and quarantine workforce is paramount. They have sacrificed so much to do what they do for us, which is why we feel obligated to make sure that they are vaccinated and that we keep them safe. And that is why, as I said, from today onwards, if a border or my queue worker is not vaccinated, their employers will need to consider alternative options for them. By the end of April, those not vaccinated will not be permitted to work in those high-risk workplaces and will be moved to other roles. 
Chinese-born filmmaker Chloe Zhao is continuing to make history, becoming the first woman of colour to win Best Director at the BAFTA Awards. Her film, Nomad Land, also took out Best Picture at this year's mostly virtual ceremony. And as Manit Sigas reports, it's the first edition since the BAFTAs launched an independent review to address a lack of diversity within the organisation. Hello and welcome to the EE British Academy Film Awards. While a handful of presenters were at London's Royal Albert Hall, the pandemic meant nominees for this year's BAFTAs attended virtually. Doing things differently due to unforeseen circumstances happened to be a key theme of the night's biggest winner. Nomadland, where a woman is forced to live in her van during the recession, won four awards, including Best Film, Best Actress for Frances McDormand and Best Director for Chloe Zhao. We would like to dedicate this award to the uh, nomadic community who so generously welcomed us into their lives. Um, they shared with us their dreams, their struggles, and their deep sense of dignity. She's just the second woman and the first one of colour to win a directing BAFTA. Last year, the British Film Academy was criticised for a glaring lack of diversity, sparking a raft of changes, including an expansion of its voting membership. This year, 16 of the 24 acting contenders came from minority ethnic backgrounds, while 21 were first-time nominees. Daniel Kaluuya won Best Supporting Actor for Judas and the Black Messiah, while 73-year-old Ya Jung Yoon was crowned Best Supporting Actress for Minari. I don't know how to say. I'm just very honoured to be nominated. I'm, no, 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 I'm the winner now. Every award is meaningful, but this one, especially recognised by British people, known as very snobbish people, and they <laughs> approve me as a good actor. So I'm very, very privileged. Meanwhile, Sir Anthony Hopkins became the oldest ever Best Actor recipient for his role in The Father, and Best British Film went to the revenge thriller Promising Young Woman. I'm so grateful to every single person who made this film. Um, it was a labour of love, um, certainly. Everyone did it pretty much for a packet of crisps. And the returns could prove even tastier, with the Oscars set to take place in less than a fortnight. Manny Tsigas, ABC News. Well, let's return to our top story. Iran has blamed Israel for an attack on its underground Natanz nuclear site. The facility lost power over the weekend, with Tehran saying it was the target of nuclear terrorism. The founder of EA Worldview, Scott Lucas, joins us out of Birmingham in the UK. Scott, great to talk to you, as always. Iran placing the blame at Israel's feet. Uh, is that the most likely scenario? Certainly, Beverly, it is. Not just because Iran says this, but Israeli officials, while not confirming the attack, have pointed to it. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at a ceremony on Sunday night, the head of the Israeli military forces. In addition, U.S. and Israeli intelligence officials have been leaking information to the media, uh, notably the New York Times, as well as Israeli media saying, yes, there was an explosion at the Natanz facility that caused the blackout. It was the Israelis that are behind it. And they are making the claim that it means production will be suspended at this, the central uranium production plant in Iran, for the next nine months. Now, that seems to be debated. They're saying nine months. Iran is saying this is not going to deter them and that they're going to be moving ahead mm. very quickly, that there won't be delays. What can we believe? Oh, I mean, we, we won't know for sure at this point because each side has got, uh, let's say, skin in the game. Uh, the United States and Israel will try to maximize this because we're in the middle of nuclear talks with the Iranians and say, look, we have limited their program or their program has been limited by someone. The Iranians will try to tough it out by saying, oh, no, these were older centrifuges. We have these newer, more advanced centrifuges, which we will install in violation of the nuclear deal, and we'll keep doing this. So there'll be a bit of chest thumping on both sides. I think what you can say is this, Beverly. We know that the plant was hit last summer, again, probably by Israel, and that it destroyed some centrifuges with an explosion. This appears to be an even bigger explosion because it appears that Iranian officials reading behind the, between the lines are rattled. They're yeah. rattled that only 24 hours after proclaiming on Nuclear Technology Day, look at our great success, 
this has all been undone. Yeah. And Benjamin Netanyahu, who has just given a press conference saying they will not, under his watch, Iran ever have nuclear weapons. As you point out, they've got a lot of skin in the game. How concerned are they by these reactivated talks trying to get Iran back under this uh, nuclear deal? Well, I think, first of all, we need to make clear that Iran is not on the verge of having nuclear weapons. If we do not return to a deal, they may choose to pursue a nuclear weapons program. Netanyahu, remember, is speaking from a personal capacity. He's trying to become head of the Israeli government again uh, domestically. The military and Israeli, Israeli military and intelligence services, while they would not want to see Iran pursuing a bomb under any circumstances, don't necessarily mean that you do not pursue a deal. Because if you don't pursue a deal, there's no limit on what the Iranians can do. How concerned or just what, how significant was the activation of these new advanced centrifuges at Natanz over the weekend? This was a major development, which has been occurring for a few months. Uh, without getting too technical, the Iranians have what are called IR-1 basic centrifuges. They have now installed IR-2s, IR-4s and IR-6s. You can tell that they're scaling up the program. And when they did it in January, they initially said, oh, it's because Parliament has demanded it. In fact, they've shifted since then. They now say, you cannot stop us from advancing our nuclear program. We don't want a nuclear bomb, but you can't stop us. In other words, they threw out a challenge to others as the talks began. And they did something else, Beverly, that's extremely important. They limited inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And only a few minutes ago, a spokesman for the Iranian uh, system, the Iranian regime, effectively accused the IAEA of leaking the intelligence that might have led to this attack. That's the type of defiance that could undo not only the talks, but it could ratchet up the tension and possibly even confrontation. Yeah, that is fascinating. And, and when Iran is vowing revenge against Israel, what form might that take? Is that even likely or is it rhetoric? Well, I mean, Iran's never going to fire a nuclear weapon at Israel because they don't have a nuclear weapon, and Israel has lots of them. Mm. What you're talking more is the asymmetric conflict, which is beyond the nuclear issue throughout the region. What happens in Syria, where you have actors on different sides? What happens on Lebanon, next to Israel, including with the Iran ally Hezbollah? What happens regarding countries such as Saudi Arabia? So in other words, the region, which is never in a position of stability, the threat from the Iranians is will continue to make it unstable, not only for the Israelis, but for others, if we do not get the pressure lifted off us. Yeah. Scott, always great to get your analysis. Thanks so much. Thank you, Beverly. Well, a private charter flight from Darwin funded by Australian veterans has delivered essential medical supplies to Timor-Leste after destructive floods and landslides caused by Cyclone Sirosia. The medical supplies delivered by the veterans included donations from the Darwin community and local businesses. As veterans, we've seen suffering and know how critical the first days of uh, a disaster like this are and the humanitarian crisis. Uh, and as veterans that have served in Timor-Leste, we have uh, an incredible affinity and bond with the Timorese people. At least 36 people have been killed in Timor-Leste, with 10 still missing after the flooding and landslides last week. The Australian government will also provide $7 million in emergency relief. A fire-damaged Antarctic ship carrying anxious crew is expected to arrive in Fremantle tomorrow. The MPV Everest was four days out of Mawson Station, heading to Hobart when the portside engine room caught fire. The ship has since been travelling away from the icy continent on an auxiliary engine. It was met this afternoon by a support vessel which will accompany it on the last leg of its journey. We've got a number of expeditioners on board who have been quite rattled by this experience, quite um, understandably and knowing that there's other vessels in the area gives them a, an additional degree of reassurance that there's support around them. The AAD says the Everest has also had to battle rough weather on its slow journey home. Well, there's been another event at a volcano on the Caribbean island of St Vincent where thousands are still without power. The volcano first erupted on Friday, blanketing the island in thick smoke. Scientists warn that eruptions could continue for days or even weeks. Ashfall is impacting water supplies as emergency officials warn more damage and destruction is likely.
to what in the world and an elephant calf has gotten into a bit of a tight squeeze after falling into a deep well in southwestern India. The calf accidentally fell to the bottom of the almost five metre well after being separated from the herd at night. Now the villagers gathered as the vocal little elephant trumpeted it loudly. Officials used an excavator to dig around the well before the fire department stepped in, pulling the calf to freedom.